Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 188 of Real Blend, a podcast that hopes they call the sequel Tune. <laughs> My name is Sean O'Connell. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm the managing I mean... editor here at Cinema Blend. Tune. You get it? Tune. <laughs> Thanks, Kev. Uh, no, no, no. I love it. Doonies and Tune in two weeks in a row. Pixar dropped, dropped a trailer for Lightyear. Uh, Last Night in Soho hits theaters. And our guests this week... Oh, this is a fun conversation. Uh, director Edgar Wright and his writer, Christy Wilson Cairns, are joining the show to discuss their collaboration. Uh, so let's get right to the introductions, because we have a ton of show to get to. Uh, and I'm going to start with Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hello, Jake. How are Hello. you? Hello. I'm doing well, my friend. How are you? Where are you? I am in Savannah, Georgia, um, our favorite, favorite place to come visit. If you're watching us on the YouTube channel, which I'll get to in a second, you'll see that I'm in a hotel. There's a backdrop. Um, they are letting me be a festival juror this year, which I'm very excited for, uh, and getting to see some really cool movies. Tonight, we're seeing the Joaquin Phoenix film, Come On, Come On. Oh, nice. Uh, tomorrow is Spencer, which I know you guys have had a chance to see. It yep. uh, closes with King Richard. Um, and they've also had, before I got down here, they had Belfast and French Dispatch. So it's a really good festival tell to them come see. You're, you're burying the lead. Tell them what you saw. What? What did I say? You saw, you know, the bench. <laughs> Hold on, let me get to Kevin first. Kevin McCarthy, Fox, 30, uh, Fox 5. Washington, D.C., Fox 32. Hi, Kev. How are you? Uh, good to see you guys, Jonathan, Gabriel, Jacob. Um, by the way, uh, this is just a super ADD note, and I do have ADD, so I'm not using that as like a joke or anything. But um, looking at your background right now, um, yes. I don't know if you remember, Sean, but what the, that recording that we did for Gravity uh, in Toronto International Film Festival back in 2013 was the first time Jake, Sean, and I had done a movie review together. It was kind of like the beginning of Real Blend, and that, that yes. video is on YouTube if you want to search it. It's really cool. Um, just search like Cinema Blend Gravity Review. Um, but I don't know if you remember, but your room had two beds just like that. Yes. And we sat on the corner of the bed you're directly behind right now and all Correct. sat there and propped up that camera right in front of the TV and did it. I don't know why, but that room reminds me exactly of that moment. And now it just to see get, us all How did three that here. moment happen exactly? Like, like I didn't feel like the three of us were at, clearly not as close then as we are now. Like, Kevin, was it just like a strange man in an elevator was like, do you want to come back to my room with a video no. camera and talk gravity? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how did that moment end up happening? We knew Sean. I mean, you, I know, and I I remember... were, you and I were really close, obviously. But uh, for people like who are listening to this, uh, listened to our show before or not listened to our show before, we didn't officially start the show until what, December of 2018 or December of 2017, whichever was it 2018? Uh, it was your Last Jedi came out. It was January when this officially started. OK, 18? so 2018. Yeah. 18. So if you think about it, back in 2013, we're reviewing this. We all walked out of gravity and we were so blown away by it that we wanted to talk about it. And all Jake, Sean and I, I don't know how we met well, up. I was I doing we a lot of um, video content for Cinema Blend uh, at yeah. the time. Like that was one of the years going up to the festival where we were like trained to turn cameras on ourselves and. Uh, just do quick, you know, video blurbs coming out of different stuff. That's probably why you asked us to do it. Well, I think I just ran into you two in the lobby, you know, and kind of knew, you know, I knew you guys. And then we just started hashing out the thing. And I said, why don't we just do it together? Do the three. The three and that was it. And then so that was 2013. And then That's five years later, Sean asks us to do this podcast. And now we have Edgar Wright on the show this week. And if you have, have, have never listened to our show before, go back. Chris Nolan, Tarantino, Russo Denis. Brothers. I mean, yeah. Denis Villeneuve, uh, Villeneuve. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, if you're watching the show, because uh, we also do it on YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, head down, hit like and subscribe. Join us here each week. Our guests allow us to videotape them, uh, and you'll see Edgar and Christy later on on the show. That uh, sounds really creepy. Listeners. It did sound, that came out weird. Our uh, guests allow us to videotape them. <laughs> outside of the show. Uh, so that content shows up on the premium episode, which you can get if you uh, sign up for uh, Real Blend Premium. You I don't like this thread. Can we cancel this thread? I don't like this thread that you're going down. <laughs> sorry, Gabe. Sorry. Uh, you can go to cinemablend.com backslash Real Blend Premium. You get an ad free version of the show, uh, a newsletter that I write every other week, and then a, a show that drops on Monday, which tends to be a little bit more free flowing, play a bunch of games, uh, and we have a good old time. We end that show by shouting, uh, used to be Larry Crown. 
Uh, it's not anymore. It's back to Hubie. No, we're back it to Hubie. It was never Hubie. It's yeah, always when, been uh, Hubie. Jake, when does your, no, your Tom Hanks thing is up already. It's up already. People can go to Jake's up, YouTube baby. channel. Tell them, what, just, tell them what they can find if they go to your YouTube channel. I will. Oh, uh, you know, that. YouTube, I, I do a deep dive on Shawshank with Morgan Freeman. Recently talked to Kristen Stewart for Spencer. The, the, you know, sky's the limit. And none of these and people, t- you couldn't get them to come on our show? Interesting. Oh, they tried to come on our show and I said, no, but I'll take right. you for television. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll okay. shamelessly right. plug myself as well. Yeah, my Tom out. Hanks interview is available on YouTube as well, and my Kristen Stewart interview. Both of them are there. So that's, uh, that's great stuff. Jake and I did them the exact same day, uh, and almost we back to back. Yeah, and for uh, I'll keep this thirty seconds. But Jake and I have known each other since two thousand ten, and for years we did these. Uh, we've discussed this on the show before. We did these things called geek out dinners, where instead of going out to parties or whatever after screenings we'd go back to a hotel and order room service and just go and we'd practice questions to each other as if we were the other person like like we i remember our most our best one i thought was spielberg or oprah yep. probably those two were memorable to me i would pretend like jake is spielberg and ask him a question so hanks rolls Sean, around which was your favorite spielberg or oprah neither yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway so to keep this quick uh uh hank this hanks interview opportunity comes up i've never i've never talked to him one-on-one before and Jake was like, dude, 10 years ago when I interviewed him for Larry Crown, um, you and I got on the phone together and I, and I got to go over my questions with you. I was like, we should do like a little 10 year anniversary when you're very uh, you nostalgic know, call. This week. And we now we did it and we got on FaceTime right before the Hanks interview. And, we, and I pretended like he was Hanks. He pretended mm-hmm. like I was Hanks. And we asked the questions. You, you, so it was cool. No, you two are just adorable. I'd like to go back to the beginning of my story. It was 2002. <laughs> Kevin goes, give me 30 I, I, seconds. I, I just want to see that. Yeah, give, give me 30 seconds. Give me t- I like that story. It's cool. You mentioned No, I, like I just wanted to see that vein and, and Gabe's forehead just throbbing. Ah, wasn't that, wasn't right, that long. Let's, let's go to the weekly poll. So we wanted to ask you guys, in light of uh, Dune coming out, and assuming that Dune is going to be an awards contender, that's, it's you know, it's early in the in the awards race to discuss this. In fact, sitting at the uh, at a festival here where a lot of potential awards contenders are playing, I was sitting with a couple of our colleagues and we were sort of throwing out names of people and titles and what do we think is in the race. Um, so, Kev, I'll go to you because I wanted to ask the people, uh, which nominations do you think Dune can land? Now, obviously, I feel like it's going to be contention for a lot of the below the line type things mm-hmm. with visual effects and sound design and, and, and areas like that, cinematography probably, Zimmer's score. What I essentially went for in this is I included best picture, best director, or both. Meaning, uh, could Denis get a nomination, but the film doesn't? Could the film get a nomination, but Denis, for whatever reason, gets left out? Or is it? Or, or do you think it has a chance to get both? Game I want like to add channel. here a lot of the comment. Not a lot. There were some people in the comments that were asking for a neither button, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to use this moment to let them know they've officially been blocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, rightfully so. Great, yes. great work, Gabe. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um. I. Oh, it's interesting. So, I'm gonna guess because I know our real blend audience is awesome that they went with both because the film. I hope they did, but if they didn't, it's okay. I understand. I mean, Dune is a. <laughs> Dune is a film that is that you know had a lot of things going on with it. Uh, I'm sure maybe people p- maybe chose picture or director. <sighs> Based on your reaction, now I gotta change it. Um, Why? No, 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 no. That's okay. Stick with what you said. I'll go with both. Mm-hmm. It deserves both, uh, and I hope they said both. But if I'm gonna actually think of one, they may have decided on. They probably went with picture. Well, a whopping fifty-seven percent of the people said both. Oh. And then director got a little bit more than picture. Director got 24 see, that, and that picture got 20. That makes no sense to me whatsoever because statistically speaking, more films will be nominated for best picture than will be nominated for director. Yeah, but that's inside. Like, we we know that. Like, like Yeah, but the people Nol- that listen but, to our show know that. But like, no, but, yeah, but like Nolan, for example. I'm, we're, we're 200 episodes into this show and we're waving off cinematic statistics? Well, no, no, no. I'm, Jake, talking about, Jake, I'm talking about you nail, like, I'm talking about you drilling down this Twitter poll. <laughs> versus like how the academy this is what we works. Do. No, no, no. I understand what you're saying, but but I'm saying it's it's people the on Twitter, you know, answer following is their heart. Yeah, the, the correct, correct answer is both. both. Yeah. And to Jake's point, by the way, like if you look at like Inception, Inception got Best Picture nomination, but Nolan didn't get a nomination for that. I think his first director nomination was Dunkirk. Um, and I want to say that there are like on this show. foreign language directors who get nominated, but then their picture doesn't get into picture. I feel like yes. we've gone over. Pan's Labyrinth. Oh no, who? no, that was no, no. Pan's Labyrinth just got. Um, 
No, no, no. There's a guy film. who just got one um, for the Mads Mikkelsen film just last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Um, My oh, God, how the, much we I know. Stuff. Dude, that was this we year. We go through that was so this year. much. This year? This year. Don't forget, dude, don't forget. We all, also, here's another thing to remember as we go into this award season. It's mm. only a 10-month-long award season. So stupid. I hate you that. You know what? I'm I, you know what? I'm glad they're fixing it now yes, and yeah, we're yeah, not going right. February to February until the end of time. You're correct. Like we had a weird 14 month one and now we have a 10 month one. Now right. can we please go back to January 1st to December 31st? I also want to point out that Denis has only ever been nominated for one Oscar for Arrival as a director. Oh, that's Wow. Well, no worthy. no screenplay so, nominations or anything? Worthy. No. Him and Nolan have the same number of Oscar nominations. Also, uh, no, the Mas- no one has more than that. No, I'm talking about. Dire- I'm sorry, directing, directing. Oh, okay. That's his. Directing. That's Denise's only nomination. Wow. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen, by the way, was the movie was called Another Year. Just one. To- Thank you very much. Yes. Throw it out there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So most people think both. Uh, we will roll with that. I can. I can totally see it happening, especially with the way that it did uh, at the box office, and we're going to discuss that on the other side. We are going to take a very quick break in order to pay some bills, and then we're going to get to our interview of the week on the other side of this ad. This episode of Real Blend is brought to you by Studio Canal Presents, the new streaming channel exclusive to Apple TV. On October 28th, Studio Canal is launching a new streaming channel exclusive to the Apple TV platform in the UK, which will offer subscribers access to a plethora of quality titles, from homegrown crowd pleasers and world cinema greats to acclaimed independent movies and classic horror. With the channel's catalog of titles growing each month, Studio Canal Presents promises to be an essential destination for anyone who loves great film and series. You can get started right now with launch titles including the Coen Brothers' Inside Lewin Davis, personally one of my favorites from the brothers, Francis Ford Coppola's seminal classic Apocalypse Now Final Cut in 4K, the award-winning Manchester by the Sea, and that's just to name a few. Studio Canal Presents is also offering TV highlights such as Hannibal, and for the first time ever on a streaming channel, the acclaimed crime drama Spiral. Our UK friends can sign up for a seven-day free trial of Studio Canal Presents right now in the Apple TV app and continue to enjoy the streaming service for just $4.99 a month. Studio Canal Presents subscribers can watch online or enjoy offline downloads of their favorite TV shows on the Apple TV app. And through family sharing, up to six family members can share and enjoy their subscription. UK listeners, head over to your Apple TV app and sign up for a free trial of Studio Canal Presents and escape to a world of great entertainment. Now, back to the show. And we are back. And it's time for this week's interview with Edgar Wright and Christy Wilson Cairns on behalf of their new film, Last Night in Soho. And one of the ones uh, that I think you're going to really enjoy an aspect of this one uh, Jake, terrific question. Is sometimes the interview just lines up, the timing of it lines up really great, and the the moment before we spoke with them, they got a great endorsement from Stephen King. So yeah. we kind of threw to Stephen King and Edgar Wright, and then realized how influential King is on on Edgar and this film, uh, and I think inf- you know influential on all of us <laughs> as well too. So yeah. um, just just a terrific conversation between these two. Uh, we're going to discuss the movie a little bit later on the show. So um, without further ado, Edgar Wright. And Christy Wilson Cairns, who who also wrote uh, 1917. Sam Mendes is uh, Men- I always botch his name. Mendes, Mendes, Mendes. Yeah, Mendes. 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 Right. Yeah. She wrote 1917. <laughs> 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 Here's our interview. See you guys on the other side. But uh, I'm going to kick us off and uh, they the have, but we did an interview yesterday where we talked about the deleted scenes of Terminator 2. So that is <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did. And as it gets. You know, it's so funny. Whenever you and I were talking about that yesterday, Edgar, the first thing I, I thought was like, God, that would have been great for the podcast, but it's going to be great for my morning show too. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, you know, I am a huge fan of, of a little known author. He's my favorite writer of all time named Stephen King. And when it comes to writing anything within the horror genre, there is no greater review you can get than having Stephen King sort of give you an attaboy and tell you that you did something right. I want you to take me to the moment that you both of you first saw that tweet that glowing review from Stephen King and what it means to you guys to craft a project like this and then have the master of horror tell you, you did a great job. Well, it's obviously like amazing because I, I, I sort of wrote a tweet last night where I don't think, you know, I probably wouldn't like have conceived of this film without being a fan of his books. 
And and it's interesting in thinking about it because not just oh, as, as a sort of young horror fan, I guess I started reading Stephen King books when I was like 13 or 14. And um, but there's so much more that I've learned from him than just about horror, e even to the point which kind of has some relevance to Baby Driver and, and Last Night in Soho. Stephen King's kind of habit of writing lyrics into like a, like a chapter or starting a chapter with Rolling Stones lyrics and just this idea of like putting needle drops in kind of novels. That was something that kind of had a big impact on me. Like, you know, obviously you see it in films in like the, the films of Martin Scorsese and John Landis, but like seeing it in a novel really stuck with me because then when you write a screenplay and you do a similar thing, you think, well, this is like, and I think even when we wrote the screenplay of this last night in Soho, there's some like parts of the stage directions that felt very much like this is how Stephen King would write it in. Like, you know, that thing where Stephen King starts to kind of describe events and it starts to become like beat poetry. Mm. So there was a sort of big part of that. I think, Christy, I was thinking about when we just when we describe in the screenplay the change of the lights, the neon. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Blue, white, red, blue, white, red, red, red. red, red, red. That's like straight out of Stephen <laughs> King. Oh, so that's exactly how Stephen King would write that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how Stephen King would write it. So the fact that he, well, number one, that he liked the movie, but B, maybe more importantly, that he's going to go and see it again <laughs> this weekend as a paying customer. Again, this is amazing. <laughs> and also the other thing I'd say about Stephen King is that what I think people like, what maybe people miss, so, so and this is something that I think is key to this movie, so many of his novels are terribly sad as well, as in mm -hmm. like, it's the thing that I think about more than the horror of them is like, so how profoundly sad they are. Like I, for example, like The Shining, it's interesting because I love the Stanley Kubrick film. I think it's a, it's amazing. I understand Stephen King's problem with it as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. And his problem with it is that in his book, the story of Jack Torrance is like a tragedy mm -hmm. because in the book, yeah. you're more in Jack Torrance's head and you know that the house or the, you know, the, the spirits are like fucking with him and he's being tricked and sort of gaslit himself. And it make and it, whilst it's like terrifying, you also know that like, it's like an awful um, trick to play on him. And that sort of, and that part of it is slightly lost in the film, you know? And it was always something that when I read that book, I was always sort of taken with how like really sad it is. Uh, Christy, I want to start with you on this one because uh, for this film to work, eventually you guys are going to have to come up with a way to visualize Ellie's transitions mm. from present day into the 1960s. Um, and if it doesn't work, it takes you out of the film necessarily. So I wanted to know what kind of conversations you guys had about how you were even going to approach that. And then Edgar, visually, I want to just find out how you got that amazing shot of when she pulls the bed sheets over and you oh, pan back yes. of like the length of a football field and still keep in focus. So. Um, we had loads of conversations about that, didn't we? Because I mean, Edgar already had the story in his head. And so when you get into like the nitty gritty of it, and it's, it's those transitions that, you know, it lives and dies on. And I think... We had talked a lot about, or maybe I had talked a lot about that scene in Train Spotting where he sinks into the floor mm. and he, he after yeah. he's taken the heroin. And that was always such a like very kind of magical realism thing to me. And it felt very much like the entrance to a dream. Um, but you were like, I, I got a better idea. <laughs> and you always do. <laughs> um, so but I remember I remember talking loads about like how does it work and how do we get back? And this this idea of like, you know, going with that character, going with Ellie. And so that feeling of like you get lulled into a dream. Sometimes you're suddenly in a dream and then you wake up. Mm. And there's no third act in a nightmare, is another like big thing. Mm. So like playing around with all those stuff so that it furthered her story. I mean, in terms of those transitions or it was also, and this kind of continues into the dream sequences themselves, is that the film has to be really experiential in that you're going on the journey with Thomas and Mackenzie mm -hmm. and you're seeing, you're seeing essentially the whole movie through her eyes. So the information that you have is the information that she has. And that's all you've got to go on is like the sort of the visions of an 18 year old girl who's having these kind of like dreams at night. Now to do that, you've kind of got to be like present these things in these kind of like long sort of unbroken sort of transitions. Like once you get into the dream, like the sort of the first time you see Anya in the mirror, it's all like one kind of flowing shot. It's a way of like not breaking the spell. It's like, sometimes people do like one as it's just like a show off technique, but in, in a lot of ways, what you're doing is just kind of sort of like 
not kind of like breaking the magic by having a cut, mm -hmm. by just kind of continuing something so that you're just kind of um, going on the, on the journey with the person. And it's kind of like, it's happening to you. Mm -hmm. the, the shot with the um, bed sheets, uh, and I think it was one of the last things that we shot actually, I felt it was on the last day of the shoot, but it was basically, we, we actually, we'd done it on a camera test before we started shooting. And then when we did the actual show, it was, I think it was one of the last days of the shoot, but it was, um, it was basically really happening to an extent. And then we had like a massive track that was pulling back and back and back. So we did have like a massive, massive sheet. And then the only way to do it, and maybe I'm giving away the magic too much, even describing this, it's probably, it's actually not quite as sexy when you actually explain how it was done. So maybe uh, I'm going to stop right now. It looks <laughs> magnificent. It looks yeah. magnificent. It's an amazing <laughs> shot. Uh, Edgar, we geeked, geeked out about this yesterday, but uh, this is for our audience. This this podcast is all about filmmaking and people love to hear about the inner workings of kind of how a shot is done. Um, in particular, there's two shots that I wanted to see if you can contrast and kind of how they were done. Specifically, the first one when she walks in the Cafe de Paris and then sees uh, Anya in, in the actual mirror. Um, and then kind of how that shot was done just for our audience because it's, it's brilliant kind of in terms of how you were sliding the mirror and everything but also the shot of the steps um when you when they are different people uh in, you know in terms of that and you see her running and then you see like multiple versions of the character i'm just wondering if you can talk about how you how you achieve uh, both of those the one in the lobby like sort of the, the first time you see anya has a number of things going on i mean that the, the, i sort of try and describe it as like what you're seeing is like less than meets the eye in the sense of like it's really happening and then, but there's still like lots of complicated kind of little tricks to fool the eye, essentially. Hmm. So what you're really seeing essentially is like Thomas and McKenzie and Annie Taylor-Joy acting opposite each other for real. It's not done in separate passes. They're standing like looking at each other and there's no, so at the start of the shot, when she walks down, you see the maitre d' in a mirror and then the maitre d' is played by Oliver Phelps. And then when he walks in front of the camera, the mirror slides back to reveal Anya. And you see the maitre d' on the other side, who is played by James Phelps, his identical twin brother. In fact, <laughs> the Weasley twins from Harry Potter. And I remind, I was talking to Anya about this last night, because it's funny, actually, um, we were, this is, this is a little aside, but we were on the red carpet for the premiere last night and Sparks, Ron and Russell Mayer were on the carpet and Anya goes, oh my God, it's Sparks. <laughs> and I said, I know. And I've never seen her. And she went up and she goes, oh, she had to stop doing her photos and rap said, I'm such a big fan. I love the film. And I said to her later, I said, the only time I've seen you that starstruck was when the Weasley twins were on set. We both <laughs> you and Thomas had the same reaction. Because I said, they, I think they didn't know that they'd even like been rehearsing with them for a little bit. And I said, you know who they are, right? They're the Weasley twins from Harry Potter. And both Anya and Thomas went, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, so like it's kind of like jazzed on the but so basically what you're then so to go back to the shot is that you're then watching amazing mirror choreography which is designed by jen y our incredible choreographer and then the actresses are just doing it at the point wow. where they're standing up with each other there's not any glass there is no glass like it's just wow. like if they tap fingers that when they tap the glass they're tapping each other's fingers wow. awesome. uh but then not to sort of take away any credit from Double Negative, the amazing digital effects house, and Tom Proctor, our VFX supervisor. What he does is some really clever shit, which is, again, fooling the eye. So, like, there's no glass there. So he makes it look like there's some glass there, and he puts things like a bevel around the glass or puts, uh. like, a fingerprint when they tap fingers. <laughs> there's lots of kind of clever stuff going on there. And then, weirdly, the, the one on the stairs, like, here's the funny thing is that there's, there's two stairs shots, one where they go down, right. uh, Anya Thompson, and one where Matt Smith and Anya run up. Mm. So the first one, and the, I, I mean, I should preface this by saying most of the mirror shots in the movie are really happening in that way that you're watching something in camera, like uh, the stuff on the dance floor is all in uninterrupted shots. The things in the mirrors where they're in, you know, different bars, like Anya and Thompson are basically next to each other. And the main reason we did that is I just thought it was going to be if you did it in separate passes on a green screen, it would be so difficult for Thomas and McKenzie and such a sort of an, a, like a, a not fun way to work because the way that we made it work otherwise where she could be there is she can be in the scene with the other actors. 
And there's, you know, usually like clever stuff happening where you put like a mirror behind Matt's head, you know, so you can see his reflection. Mm. But the one where they come down the stairs is actually a motion control shot. Um, oh, cool. because it was the only it was the only way to do that one because we couldn't have a double set and the mirror was like slatted. And so we had like this this motion control shot. But there's there's a tricky part to this as well. So it's all timed in with the song that's playing. Anya has to walk down the steps on a certain counts. So the choreographer is, it's funny, Annie was saying last night, she says, I can, when I watch those shots, I can still hear Jen counting. <laughs> and one, two, three, four. So she has to do that. But then imagine this. So for the shot to work, Thomason then has to do the same thing in a separate pass. Well, do, what does Thomason have to do differently from Anya to make the shot work? My question to you. Start later? Does she have to start later? No, she has to look in a different direction because oh, if yeah. she did the same thing as Anya, you would just see the back of her head. So what Thomas and Mackenzie has oh. to do is walk down the steps looking at herself. So the <gasps> thing that's recorded on film is like you can see her face. And then beyond that, she has to sort of look at herself and then look at the singer <laughs> on stage and then look back at herself. But that's what's funny. So actually, here's the funny thing is that we designed these these two shots with their motion control shots and you have the big motion control rig which is quite a ungainly and time consuming thing and then strangely that shot at the end when they run up the steps was not one that was storyboarded but me and chung chung hoon had sort of seen this other angle and said you know you're standing at the top of the step saying hey this is a good shot yeah. and i know that if i said to the double negative guy saying hey, we want to do another one of those shots. <laughs> they, would all, they would all have a complete nervous breakdown. So the second one, this is what's really crazy. The second one when they run up the stairs is not a motion control shot. We did what we call the poor man's moco, where basically the grip just mimics the same move and does it again. And we just shot it with like, Anya and Matt run upstairs and now Matt and Thomason run upstairs. And just, you know, and just, just basically just, it's the thing where you say to it's, it's where you say to the grip, like you say, uh, like poor man's moco. We just call it the muscle memory. <laughs> it's like muscle memory. It's like, can you do it exactly the same again? Like no computer. It's like, and so that that shot in a, in a weird way to me is more impressive because we just kind oh. of replicated wow. the same shot again. And it's really, but also then what like, but even within that, the thing that Matt Smith particularly had to do is like you have to like which foot first on the stairs. Left, uh, you know like you had to run exactly the same way i mean i think the finished things are really seamless and um you know so i'm i'm very sort of proud of them. but but within the movie we sort of ended up doing every single trick in the book and some of the most impressive ones are like really well, not so much lo-fi they're just kind of like what you're seeing is what you're seeing you know Wow. It gives me so much At the same time, he's telling a story. Me. Yeah, he's, he's, it's amazing to me. Gosh. Um, this is for both of you guys. I uh, Every once in a while, a, a movie will have the power to change how I hear a song. I can hear a song a thousand times, but if, if, if it's featured a certain way in a certain film, I'll never hear it the same way again. And, and it happens a lot with songs in Quentin Tarantino films. Uh, and I think it's going to happen with Downtown. I think for the rest of my life, when I hear Downtown, I'm going to think of this film. I'm sort of curious where how did you guys fall on that song in particular? Because the way she sings it is beautiful oh. and haunting. And I'm sort of curious, were, were there ever any other songs in contention for that moment? Well, the strange thing about that one is that, uh, I, you know, when we started, like I, I developed the story for a long time before I even met Christy. So when Christy came on board, what existed was like the, the story, like this big time of research and like the songs and I sort of had the songs literally like a hit list in terms of like, these are the types of songs that should be in this movie in terms of the tone. And then some songs were kind of attached to scenes. But when we were like, it was actually, the, the audition scene did not exist in my original outline and it was Christy's suggestion. Um, well, you can say. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, I think originally a lot of the 60s stuff was going to be just music and no dialogue. And I think when we got in there and when we realized, you know, what Ellie's journey is going to be and this idea of like, you know, becoming obsessed with this girl in the past, I like, you need to hear her speak. You need to see like, you know, her charm, her charisma, her ambition, her humor. It's like, that's the only way that, that Ellie can fall in love with her and that the audience can fall in love with Sandy. And then 
I felt like we we needed an extra dream sequence. And together we both thought, oh, an addition scene. So you get the, the furthering of that like dreamlike kind of idea, like, oh, we've had the amazing night in Cafe de Paris and now she might get her dreams. Everything might come through. It might all work out. Um, and actually to see like, you know, how incredibly talented Sandy is that she does deserve this. Um, and mm. so we, we were we were like talking that through I pitched the audition scene and I think before I'd even finished speaking, you're like, it's going to be downtown because <laughs> you just know you just have such a almost like a sixth sense for what music is going to just work. But then the other funny part of it, and actually weirdly, I was talking to Anya about this last night. She said, <laughs> um, she said, oh, it was a real leap of faith from you of getting me to sing because I, I didn't know. I think it was that thing like sometimes when you ask an actor is like, do you sing like most actors? In, in scared of not getting the job, like, you're like, can you horse ride or can you sword fight? They say, oh, yes, I can ride a horse. You know, I said to Anya, I said, do, do you sing? She goes, oh, yeah, no, I sing. But I wasn't sure, like, I thought, <laughs> well, let's get her in to sing with Steve Price, the composer, and, and see how that goes. And then, you know, so I think Anya went in to do a session with Steve where so we're going to sing downtown in a couple of different versions. Let's try... A, a, a normal, you know, like the traditional one, like the Petula Clark version. And let's try this kind of like slow version. And I, I remember that Steve saying like, oh, she has an amazing voice. Like there was, there was that, you know, and it was like, so it was a real like magical moment of like, oh, wow. You know, I saw the video of her singing and I said, this is going to be special. And weirdly, we actually had a pianist, bizarrely like the pianist Roddy, who's the pianist at the Groucho Club, which is a famous Soho members club, came to sort of play with her. I mean, we had these piano versions, but we also had these a cappella versions. And in listening to it, we were at one point we were thinking, well, let's cover both. And then it was like always time-wise on a shooting day. It's like, no, let's just pick one. It's like it's the it's the down, it's the downtown down tempo version a cappella. It's like so spine tingling. Yeah. So the strange thing is I didn't know she was going to do it that great until I heard it. And I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Uh, there's a subtext running through uh, the entire film, which I didn't expect at all. And, and maybe I'm reading too much into it. And Christy, you can tell me if I'm way off on this, which is um, this deeply cynical sort of look at the pie in the sky, move to the big city, chase your dreams uh, element. And uh, I'm just wondering where that evolved from, from maybe where you guys were earlier in your career, where, you know, to whether it's fashion or for for it's singing for some of the characters. Um, and then and for Edgar, it's almost a little bit of, of a flip on Hot Fuzz, which is like, don't leave the city and head out to the country where it's a disaster. Now the country <laughs> seems really appealing <laughs> and the city seems really terrifying. I mean, I think that the answer is I don't like living anywhere. <laughs> get that Jeff Bezos money, I'll go into space event. Finally, and then and then we'll finally get our Edgar. Uh, I, love space I love the country. I love the country. I love the country and the city, but it's complicated. Hmm. It's complicated. Yeah, I don't think it's wholly cynical. I think it's honest. I mean, I remember moving from Glasgow, which is a city in its own right, but moving to the big city, moving to London, hmm. and thinking like, you know, I I was maybe like 21, 22 at the time, and be like oh yeah here I go coming to film school watch out London and then arriving in London and just being like oh oh this is hard um and I'm really uncool and I don't have any friends and I feel like a loser um, and I think that's like you know I don't know that's cynical I think that's honest and I think it's an experience like loads of people go through um yeah so I, I it was always based on like I suppose with those characters trying to make them relatable and like infusing your own agonizing pain into them is usually very helpful yeah. This question is for both of you. I um, am so happy this movie's only being released in theaters. And obviously we're in a very different uh, environment right now in terms of like theatrical releases. They just announced Dune Part 2 because it did so well enough at home and in theaters that they were able to do a sequel. But your movie actually comes out in theaters only, which is amazing, like exclusively in theaters. So I wanted to get each of your favorite theatrical experiences you've ever had. Uh, a film that you saw in an audience with a crowd where that communal aspect uh, made that film special for you? And I, I know there's probably numerous uh, for both of you, but is there one in particular that comes to mind where you saw it with an audience, just as we're kind of returning to theaters and celebrating to see movies this way? I always, I mean, there's so many, like, I always really remember because it's in a sort of pre-internet age where there weren't that many materials out. It was just the buzz about something, which was just kind of like word of mouth buzz rather than like necessarily having seen clips or like, huh. you know, we didn't have a thing where they were like, you know, kind of like 
40 minutes of clips from the new Marvel film online before it comes out. Um, but I remember a bit of shade there, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, but you know, like uh, I, the thing that I remember was seeing, I must have been like 17, seeing Science of the Lambs at the cinema on opening weekend. And just this sort of like electricity in the room because everybody had heard it was great. And then it really was great. And then also people are fucking terrified. <laughs> and just feeling like not necessarily people jumping out of their seats, more this feeling that everybody was cowering in their seats. And it was just that thing where like, you just could hear a pin drop and just got this feeling that everybody was terrified. And I remember really vividly, the thing that I really remember is the audience starting to go crazy when Clarice Starling and like Buffalo Bill meet. Mm -hmm. Um, before yeah. like before he you know but, but, like where the kind of the penny drops for her and it's that shot of the kind of the moth landing on the reels and the audience is going ah <laughs> I, just, I just remember that really vividly of just like how electric it was in that screen in that screen and I never forgotten that wow Christy for you I mean I, I remember I want to see Mad Max Fury Road like pretty jet lagged I just landed I just landed in like I was staying in Santa Monica and I just kind of walked out into the cinema and it was on and I remember thinking oh this would be good to like adjust me to the time period and then just like <laughs> essentially just screaming at the screen just like ah! um, and it was like Spraying truly and, your, and everyone, here, everyone in the audience we were, it was almost like you know you know when you've been in a wind tunnel and your hair's just swept by it was like everyone in the audience was just like that um it was really incredible and then my other one is I, I went to see I went to see Inception in Glasgow where I'm from with a Scottish crowd and I remember the bit where you know this sort of world in Paris folds over and I just always remember going to someone oh that's weird a wee Scottish lady screaming <laughs> it and then the audience erupting in laughter and I think that's like I think that I'm always for a bit of audience participation um I do like that well, that's awesome I, I have Thank stuck you. in my head I can't think of this movie without somebody crying out when I saw Robin Hood Prince of Thieves at the cinema <laughs> This young kid, I don't know if you remember Kevin Costner comes like uh, onto the beach at the start of the movie and like kisses the ground out. He kisses the, the, and I remember this kid saying, just saying really loudly saying, mommy, why is he kissing the sand? <laughs> <laughs> I can't really think of, when I think of that movie, that's the first thing I think of. Not any lines from the movie, but just saying, mommy, why is he kissing the sand? Oh, the theatrical the legitimate experience. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that, she, I'm not sure she was able to answer it. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't try to kiss the beach if I'd landed. <laughs> right. No. Not an English speech. Immediately. <laughs> Guys, uh, you know, so much of this movie is just sort of about the idea of, of being haunted, being haunted by a lot of different things. And I was wondering what the, the filmmaker, the writer equivalent of that. Is there a, another scene you'd wish you had another go at, another, another scene you wish you had another take on? Is there any aspect of your work that you're haunted by that you still think about to this day? I mean, there's always something like sort of where... Um, yeah, I mean, in all, all of my my films, there's like, I can't watch I can't watch any of them, and I'm not like so cocky to sit back and say, ah, it's a perfect masterpiece. Every single scene and shot, there's always something that like just nags at me that I kind of like say, oh, if I did it again, I would do this. So there's always those bits, and sometimes you don't really want to reveal what they are because you want the chance to sort of fix it in a future project it's good. <laughs> but I wouldn't like do anything where I go back and do something I think kind of like you're probably you know it's always funny to me where there's sort of some films where people seem to kind of like I don't know how many more versions of Apocalypse Now there are going to be but it's like you know what man just leave it the first one was fine <laughs> I guess like smashed it I, I think you know as a writer I'm not really haunted by the projects that didn't get made because like you know they sit in a draft and they get cannibalized and used in other stuff um, I'm haunted by the things I kind of didn't get to write and I was up I was pitching for you know the video game Portal I was pitching yes. to do an adaptation of that and I love that video game obsessed with it and it was quite early on in my career and I came up with what I think is the best story ever uh, and I pitched it and they were like nah and sometimes at night I play scenes from that in my dreams <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that's that's the only thing I'm haunted by is that I didn't get to make the Portal movie. 
Well, we're uh, going to get Now I want to hear your portal yeah, pitch. I want to hear what you pitched. Tell them to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the good news is nobody made the portal movie. So no one made the portal movie, so it's still there. Nobody wants me every Not night. Yet. I'm like, oh. Edgar, you direct it and Christy writes it. So I'm, I'm, I'm out on video game adaptations. <laughs> okay. yeah, that smart. You we did are, make the ultimate, yeah. We are that's, out of time. It's, that's, it's more a video game aesthetic. It's not an, a direct adaptation of a game. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I wish we had more time with each of you guys. We're so excited for people to be able to see the film. Uh, obviously, we're going to drive everybody to it. We're huge fans of it. Thank you guys for taking the time. We really do uh, appreciate thank it. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you very much to Focus Features for giving us time with Edgar and Christy. Thank you for uh, to Edgar Wright and Christy Wilson-Cairns as well, too, for being guests on the show and diving into their incredible film. Uh, I just want to paint the picture really briefly because people tend to like the behind-the-scenes stuff on, of that conversation. Uh, that day in particular, uh, we did a, a junket interview or a, a real blend interview that's going to run soon, which I won't tip my hand to. Uh, then the boys did... Uh, Kristen Stewart uh, for uh, Spencer. Sorry, I was blanking on that one. And then we went into the Edgar Wright and also Carrie and Russell. And, yeah, we also interviewed Carrie Russell. Russell. So like, Jake and I, like ba- Jake and I, basically got off our morning shows and went right into an interview, a press, ju- a TV junket interview with Carrie Russell and Scott Cooper uh, for Antlers. That that went late, and then we ended up ha- like the the interview you're going to hear next week was a little delayed. So then the delay of that interview was bleeding into our time to check in for Kristen Stewart uh, for yeah. Spencer. And then thankfully that was on time because right after Spencer was over, we jumped into Last Night in Soho with Edgar and Christy. And one of the crazy things that I, I do want to point out, I'm glad you brought that up, is like, and this is no no complaining whatsoever. It's just you're, when, you're, when you're jumping in and out of three different films within like three hours and you're and you're talking to talent and scattering it, it's 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 kind of insane. And I don't know. I mean, Jake, I don't know, Jake, how you feel. I get I get super uneasy. Um, I can't like I'm just trying to focus on which one I have coming up next. And like, you know, I'm, I watched Spencer the night before and like I was it was just and then I watched Antlers that morning and I'm trying to get it all together. But uh, yeah, so the interview that I'm glad Sean mentioned that because leading up to that, um, there was a lot of our text thread was like, boom, boom, guys, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Are you guys there? OK, are we, are we all checked in. Uh, is everyone on deck? You know, it, it, well, it was it was pretty wild. God, I'm sorry. Jake. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, like, I'm someone that needs to the way my brain works. Like, I need to be able to compartmentalize. I need to be able to separate, um, even if it's a matter of ten minutes in between. So once we get into that headspace of like, oh, we've got to kind of get through this interview because as soon as this interview is done, I gotta pop over and go over to that interview. Is when I like my mind starts going like, what the hell is going on? Because I have yeah. to have some kind of a mental separation between Edgar Wright and Kristen Stewart and Carrie Russell for Antlers. Like I need at least just a moment to decompress and then get back into the headspace of wherever I need to be for the next yeah. film. And the also the day I before, hated- Jake and I already spoke, we spoke to Edgar Wright the day before. So we had like mm. questions written for the junket that we wanted to ask. And then, and then, and then the idea was like, okay, how do we make it different from what we just talked to him about <laughs> the day before? Yeah. So it's, just, it's, it's interesting, but I, we, we love it. And I'm so happy how that interview turned out. And because you know, and Sean, I think you would agree in terms of like when, when the detail he goes into about shooting those mirror scenes is so insane to me. Um, and I can't think of it I, as he was saying everything he was saying about how they filmed the mirror scenes. All I thought to myself was this is just the technical camera setup. This guy's mm-hmm. still trying to tell a story mm-hmm. at the same time. But look how long it took him just to explain how they did it. two shots in the whole film. But you know like, what I think back to though? Like, as he's telling that story, I think back to the precision that he put into Baby Driver. Yeah. And, yeah. and how Baby Driver's edited so beautifully to the music. Yeah. And it's just, that's the way his brain works. Like It's amazing. Edgar doesn't know how to tell a story any other way. Mm-hmm. You know, he has to come up with some sort of weirdo choreography that, that has people in mirrors, you know, timed out to come down the stairs. Because just that's just what he's used to doing. So, so uh, the one thing I just want to throw in before we move on quick is the one thing I hate about when we rush from like one to one to one is that then I tend to forget that we did one of them, you know, yeah. like, we didn't <laughs> yeah. live in it long enough. Right. We didn't barely processed it. So then like, well, yeah. I'll think about the person who's going to run next week. And I'm like, Oh my God, I totally forgot. We even did that. And that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. So. That becomes an issue. Like you, you want to live in it more and, yeah. and, and it's so fast paced that it's almost hard to, and Sean's well, so right. Yeah. Speaking of something we want to live in more, uh, 
the spice planet of Arrakis is a place where we would like to spend I want some to move more time. There with <laughs> some more time. And Hans now, Zimmer I don't not. Even, I do not I even, want to move there. What about that movie makes you want to move there? I, I don't no, know. I'm, I'm just, I just love the world. Um, and this might be, so let's get to the part that, that Dune Part 2 uh, has been confirmed. And, Dunes. You know, Dune. we, we had this conversation <laughs> with the dollar sign. <laughs> We had this conversation last week of like, when were they going to announce it? When did it make sense for them to announce the fact that they'd greenlit it? Um, if you knew a sequel was coming, was that going to encourage more people to go? Uh, would you potentially wait until they were both finished? Dune Part 1 has made $223.2 million worldwide. A huge success when you consider the fact that it's available on streaming as well, too. Which makes me think that they really did convey the message of... If you want to see this, see it on a big screen. I don't doubt that plenty of people press play on their HBO Max, but I do sure. think it convinced enough people to go on out uh, and see it. So I, anecdotally, I do think there's something to the scale of it that mm -hmm. uh, people I've noticed some fr friends who aren't necessarily like film buffs, um, but like enjoy movies um, assumed it was theatrical only. They were like, oh, you can stream that. Like I said that and I said. Uh, oh, cool. uh, you can, uh, yeah. I said, but if you're willing to go to a theater, please do. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think a lot of them just kind of assumed like, oh, that looks like a giant movie. Like, why would that be? Why would There's I watch no that way. on my TV? Even yeah. if they're not the kind of person that's thinking about the TV versus theatrical experience, which I thought was interesting. The one so thing I think is, the, is so yeah. incredibly cool about this is I love <clears throat> how excited the cast was. The cast was all yeah. over social media. Hans Zimmer was, was excited. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like right down. They all know how special this is and you know we don't even have to say how excited Denis was like obviously he's living in this you know this is his dream world and the fact that he gets to go back uh is is so incredible kevin i know that you were uh, so extremely fired up for uh for dune 2 to get announced um but what i want to ask jake and gabe because they uh know where the story's going um do we go like it, 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 is it like way beyond arrakis is it just kind of more arrakis like I don't want to say. What are we expecting with Dune Part Two? I don't want to know. <laughs> Can yeah. you give me like a? I'm not saying I don't want plot specifics. Yeah. But like... So I will say that the the I think the way that Dune Part One ends, um, and I th I think I said this last week on the show is was very much a tease of like this is just the beginning. Literally, this is just the beginning of mm. um what we're gonna discover about what's next. I don't want to get because maybe someone hasn't seen it yet, and we're not okay. in a spoiler protected area, so I don't even want to mm. say what happens at the end, but. But the way that the end is set up is makes you feel like there's more. And I think it's implying that the world itself that Paul Atreides finds himself in is going to grow. Okay. So, and, and I, I, Gabe, I have a question for you. And I, uh -huh. I, I know we touched on Dune Messiah last week. And the rumor is that if Dune Part 2 does well enough, that potentially... Denny could take the next book, which is Dune Messiah, yeah. and make he, it the he third. He said film that in a he trilogy. sees that as a trilogy, like like part it, one and part two would be Dune, like it would be a complete sure. story of Dune. But he sees it as being wanting to do a trilogy. So I'm curious, wow. do you know enough about Dune Messiah? Can that fit into like if Dune had to be split into two movies? Can Dune Messiah be one movie and just be the last one? I don't know enough about Dune Messiah. I I, okay. I in Denny I trust. Where if he said he wants sure. it to be a trilogy and that one to be a whole book, I'm totally. I think he. I mean. He's made perfect movie after perfect movie. I think he knows how sure. to structure a film. So yeah. I uh, I assume it, it is if that's the way he feels. Yeah. But, but and I then you, I guess you don't it. have to like really lay the groundwork and set the rules right. and introduce the world. Like all of Dune Part One is all of Dune Part One is really just setting up the right. world in order for it to his, end. Yeah, his two, passion. Two quick things. Oh. oh, I just want to add his passion in our interview uh, for the source material. I have not re-listened to it. Yeah, I got to re-listen to it. It's really Dude. good. There's a moment at the end, toward the end of it, when he's describing shooting a scene uh, out in the desert, and he says, "I'm standing next to Paul." He doesn't even refer to him as Timothy. He's like, "I'm standing next to Paul Atreides, and I'm listening to this music." And he goes, "It's and and I'm saying him. I'm saying to myself, it's so close to the way that I've pictured it in my head, you know, since I was a, a child." And I'm like, "God bless you. I'm so happy that you got this opportunity yeah. because." You know, it's not like a gun for hire. You know, it's somebody who truly yeah. loves this material and for him to connect with the audience is, not, is brilliant. Not that we need to dissect our own interview over and over again, but I did love because <laughs> Jake and I talked about the quote from uh, Neil Gaiman, who it was, who said uh, the, the golden age of sci fi is when you're 12 years old. And that took him down a thread from that question on where he was kind of discussing and reflecting on that 12 year old self. Yeah. Beautiful. We got some beautiful answers from him talking about kind of 
what the book meant to him growing up and how that was very much his entire influence. Well, in, also, in his review it. of his review of Tenant went That's made the great. rounds. <laughs> before yeah, we get to yeah, Kevin, yeah. because I because I, I want to get Kevin's reaction to this. Before yeah, we get sorry, to Kevin, Kevin, is there another is there another better pairing that's been pitched? Right now, after like we see how great it is to see Denis and Dune together, is there anything better than Mike Flanagan and Dark Tower? Uh, no, I there's saw not. that going around. No, like, there is just no. I saw no. that and my mind just went. No. I don't, I don't know enough about Dark Tower, but I understand the scope of it, and I could see why that he's it would be insane. Well, and it's Maybe not Edgar even, Wright will do it. Uh, yeah, you're, the way you're pitching Edgar Wright on projects, um, the way you know Dark Tower is not like anything that Flanagan has done yet to this point. But the only reason sure. why I think that he is so perfect. Or it is because of how much he adores King and the source material. Like, um, I, like I think he's a much better fit for something like Revival, which is still sort of contemporary and deals with a lot of the themes that he ended up exploring in Midnight Mass. Um, you know, Dark Tower needs somebody who has an eye for that sort of epic scope, like a sci-fi western type thing. So I'm not even saying that he's the best fit for it, but God, I'd love to see him give it a shot because he's Mike freaking Flanagan and... Uh, and he's genius. Kev, I'm sorry. What's your reaction? No, no, two, just two things. I uh, When I went back, and I went back and clipped something when they announced Dune 2 yesterday, I was re-watching uh, Denise's answer to my question about, you know, why they didn't shoot it back to back, and like, what the, it, it did Dune Part 1 in the title card definitively mean you'd make a, a second one? And if you just watch his answer, um, like, when he says, I decided to do a gamble, I mean, mm. I, I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around his headspace like okay studio gives him 165 million dollars he films half of story mm. and he is just hoping that somehow this will get enough of a reaction that he'll be able to complete it and to me uh, the restraint that I, I i don't know how you do that like i don't know mentally how you compartmentalize that how do you even focus on the first half if you're not even if, it, if the second half hasn't even been greenlit and you're worried about whether or not you know i just find that amazing and under that pressure he still made a masterpiece um and just like you said there's something so special about how excited he gets i wanted to point out this video he uh he breaks down the gam jabbar scene um on youtube it's a i think it's a vanity fair video it's it's unbelievable it's 17 minutes of him like walking through the scene almost like you know the nfl games where they like circle things and you know it's amazing watching him break it down um when this episode comes out uh on a friday so tomorrow is thursday we're recording on a wednesday um i'm finally going to see it in 143 which is the ultimate uh, way to see it and it's an hour away from my house there's only like less than 30 theaters in the country playing it this way um and i think it's gonna i, I don't know what's gonna happen i don't know if i'm gonna be able to handle it i don't know if i'm gonna be able to i mean it's gonna be a six well, you're gonna story. get a few more inches on the top and bottom it's gonna be exciting no 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 this is a six <laughs> story imax screen that opens up to one four three it's not a couple more inches this is like feet like, like this is gonna be huge yeah. and then zimmer score pumping through an air and space science museum theater with the IMAX laser and 143. I mean, I, IMAX made, made a lot of money for this movie this weekend. I they think did. it was like 10, 10 million of the 40. Like, I think like I could say a quarter of the, yeah. of the domestic box office. That's amazing. Because people went out and saw it. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to listen to our interview yet and you want to find out what scenes blow up to the IMAX, just go go to go to the Denis interview where he talks about like what scenes, because it, it's narratively, it's not, it's not just to go to IMAX. He does it. He punctuates dreams. He punctuates the 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 sand and the, and the desert. So it's all narrative decision making. That's why he's a genius. It's incredible. Jake, I was just I was just gonna say really quickly. I will say that after the news broke, uh, and I covered it on my show this morning, that multiple people individually at my studio came up to me and said. All right, I guess I got to go see part one now. Like, if exactly. they're making part two, and I was like, yeah. yes! like, like yeah. yes. Honestly, I didn't even. I just said yes. Go see it. So yeah, I, I thought that was a cool reaction. I don't want those sympathy. I guess I'll I, want, I, I do. Want I, want I do. Yes. I yeah, I'll one take one like yeah. a, a dollar spend the same. To Dune. <laughs> don't. Do it. it just came out four days ago. People have yeah. plenty. Of, they, they should go. Yes, I agree. I'm going. For my, this will be round three for me on Thursday. Right. I can't wait. Well, I, I assume if it's anything like Tenant, you'll see it at least a dozen times. I think Tenant of it fifteen. Yeah. No. All right. Yeah. Let's get to the Lightyear trailer reaction. <laughs> uh, I was totally confused by this because I was under the impression, and maybe I just was wrong from the get go, that this was a live action movie. I didn't think it was going to be animated. I thought you didn't Chris see Evans. The... What, what? What? I thought Chris Evans was playing the Buzz Lightyear astronaut 
that the toy eventually was going to be based on. He is. But it was oh, always going to be Pixar, story. though. I remember that story. But I didn't no, know. See, that's what I, I thought the story know. was going to be, but I always assumed it was going to be animated. It, th- they show him animated in the in the teaser that they released. Like yeah, the first they time. released a, they released an animated uh, like a screenshot. Yeah, I thought I only saw the title. It was more than there was, the a, title. there was a there was an image that was released. It's like him oh, in a cockpit. Really? Look like or yeah, like him that. in a cockpit. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally missed that. I honestly thought that this was a project that they were going to have a live action Chris Evans. You couldn't playing do an astronaut. <laughs> Wouldn't that, that suit look awful live action though? It the would. Toy. It would look. Ta- it would look like tacky. Yeah. I, have, yeah, I am yeah. still I confused as to what the plot of it because, like, to Sean's point, I will say my my understanding was that the toy was based. Is it based on a real life astronaut, well, or is it based like on a Neil on a, Armstrong? You know, got a toy. Right. So then, right. what kind of? I guess we're talking about a world in which toys. Well, but, but like, what well, kind of world does Andy live in? I guess I, is what I'm asking. I thought yeah. this was just the movie that the toy was based on, like okay. the movie that, itself. That, that's that what I had case? heard. Uh, that it, it's not that this will have any uh, reference uh, to Toy Story. This is like the blockbuster movie. This is the movie, movie that Andy would like. Andy's mom would have taken Andy to and go see. And he said, "I want the toy. I want Buzz Lightyear because this uh, is this is the movie that that's based on." Okay, that's, that's fun. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, right? yeah, I, that's, that's what I understand. Cool I thought that's what they announced at their um, at the uh, investor meeting that that was a part of where they because we've gotten kind of correct me if I'm wrong it's been a long time since I've seen it Toy Story two kind of dives into like the old TV show that Woody was a part of Woody's right? Roundup yes, yes of course so this this would be just the other thing this is the new cool thing so that, if we have cool. Woody was based looks on a TV show cooler than anything film. Pixar's ever done it looks it so awesome. cool. it's the most I've been excited about a and, and and you're talking to someone who is like sick of Pixar sequels by this point. This very much intrigues me. I th- oh, I'm all in. I think the that trailer, trailer looks great. Is yeah. a, I mean, it's very Star Wars. I mean, like, the, 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 yeah, there's which, which, so which, which, much Star Wars in that trailer, uh, especially, like, the light speed aspect of it. I mean, it makes sense. It, 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 it's all... It, it, to me, the trailer was exciting. Uh, I, I actually love that we only got one word from Chris Evans, which was just and, yeah. um, which is a really cool. I, I thought that was so smart not to finish that full line. Like that we don't yeah. we don't that was that was a really good teaser. Like sometimes these these trailers give away too much. And as as Edgar Wright even said in our interview for Soho, it's like we live in a day and age where we're getting clips and trailers and 40 clips for every single movie we see. Yeah. Uh, and for like that little tease now makes me want to see it. I Lightyear wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't even really on my radar. I mean, I was like interested in it. It sounded interesting. I like that Chris Evans was involved, but the trailer sold me. I'm all in. It looks great. Currently immersed in uh, heated online debates with the uh, Spider-Man film Twitter community of how I didn't know there was such a such a sub 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 well, Twitter community wade into my waters every once in a while. My never, friend, ne- I, because... I've gotten a taste of your Snyder cut waters, and I yeah. will never swim in that ocean again. They, uh, yeah, well, it's a little the, salty. Whatever reason we are, <laughs> we are, you know, less than well, salt water. Two is months this, away the, from is that the shirtless the Aquaman scene? Is that what you're talking? About? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, you know, like they're they're demanding a, a second trailer, and it's like, well, what? you're gonna see it. Yes, exactly. Like, and then just like, wait. Honestly, I would be perfectly fine with nothing else. We'll get right. a second one. We always get two. Oh, right? you're definitely going to get a second one for sure. Always get two. But yeah. it's when not going to show what people one, want them to show. No, but even when you watch it, you're going to watch it and say, Ugh, I gave away too much. Like, yeah, I spent weeks asking for it. Then I watched it and I'm mad at Sean, what it showed. Let me ask you this. Yes. Is there any po- I mean, I know your job. Uh, is your job, but is there any possible way that you could avoid the second trailer? Yes, I could. Probably. Could you? Could I don't you, believe you have it in you. I probably could pull rank like as a bit, and like, say, say, like I don't, I don't want to see. Yeah, this. yeah like I'm not gonna watch. This. I'm too excited. I'm not. Yeah. When, when, I, when's the last time you pull? I'm curious. I'm, I'm fascinated with Sean O'Connell pulling rank at Cinema Blend. When's the last time you pulled rank? <laughs> When he got to go to the set of uh, No Way or uh, 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 Far I, From I, Home, I made them. I made them start a podcast with uh, <laughs> them. <laughs> so that we could interview some of our favorite directors. <laughs> hey, I'm glad no, you pulled rank. We on that. really uh, distribute the. We try to distribute the wealth, and honestly, yeah. at Cinema Blend, there's a, a bunch of people who have their specialties. Yeah, like yeah. Mike and Reyes is a. Yeah, you guys do a great job. You guys do. Yeah, you guys do a fascinating job. I always love. 
And there'll be multiple moments where, like, just selfishly, as someone who wants to do everything, I'll say, Sean, I'm a, like, I'm amazed you gave Junket X away. And you'll go, well, it means more to this person. And that's when I realize how much better of a person you are than I am. Because if I ran <laughs> Cinema Blade, I'd go, don't care if, if you were raised on Bond. I really want to do this one. But I'm also, and then Sean, like, Sean brought in Hannah on the Snyder interview, which was I thought was amazing, too. Oh, that's too, so because, cool. I, that's right. Uh, I forgot about that. Oh, she had yeah. put in so much work into that at that point, yeah. too. Um, you know, but, like, you know how I hated I would be if I took everything, you know? Like... And legitimately, like everyone you, on staff would deserve I, you, how much me. more hated you. Yeah, I, was saying, yeah. Yeah, I, so I didn't know if I could pile on with the jokes. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the movies that are opening up this week, starting with uh, A Mouthful of Air. So I actually have a screener link for this one. It's a, a romantic drama from Sony. It stars Amanda Seyfried. I just haven't had a chance to watch it yet. But by the time you guys listen to this week's show, uh, my review for it will be posted on Cinema Blend. I'm writing the official review for the site. So make sure you go by and check it out if you want to see what I thought of it. Uh, we are going to have director Scott Cooper. The 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 uh, interview we've been teasing is director Scott Cooper, and he uh, directed a, a film called Antlers, and we got a chance to speak to him, but we're running it next week. But it opens this week. You can go check it out. That's what the boys spoke with Kerry Russell about. Uh, and he brought this up <clears throat> a lot, and I think this is pretty influential as to why he was doing this. It's produced by Guillermo del Toro. And there is a decent amount of uh, creature design that I think is very in the in the wheelhouse of Guillermo. Um, it's kind of a myth. You know, it's one of those myth films where uh, a, a child goes missing. There's a, a monster that's that's out in the woods kind of thing. It's set in the Pacific Northwest, which sets a mood for it, too. Um, I, the, I want to say I this about this movie. the mood, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I, I was confused by this movie. Um, there was something that happened in the opening 30 minutes with a kid... Um, that because there's two kids involved, right? And and the same I thing was, happened to me. The same okay, thing good. happened Thank to you. me. I Thank know you exactly much. what you're saying. Okay, I just okay. didn't know which kid I was watching. I didn't I know had, what happened. They, they looked, okay, but here's here's what I'm going to say. Thing. They did some in the, in the first scene. A man is speaking to a child, yes. and he says something that I thought a normal person would not say. That he says, "We need to go get your brother, Lucas." Okay, and in, in my head, I just thought like. That's not how people speak. Like we, like my, like my mom would never say, "Hey, let's go get your sister Heather." Right. Like right. She, so, I think they're specifically saying, "Hey, when we introduce this kid Lucas, don't forget that okay. this kid, that the, the brother of this kid yeah. is no, Lucas." It went, That's moving right yeah, over my right. head, Sean. It went. Uh, there was a moment, like thirty minutes into the movie, where I was like, "Oh, wait a second, I had the kids completely mixed up." Yeah. Like, the, like, the only yeah, reason it stood yeah. out to me is because I thought it was weird writing at the moment, but it, to okay. me, it was it was written with a purpose. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I, I liked this movie. I I thought it was decent. I I really liked the creature design. It's probably not as effective as I uh, hoped that it would be, um, but I would definitely recommend it, especially if you like. It's weird because if you like Scott Cooper's films, this is nothing like anything that he's ever done. Uh, and he'll talk in our interview next week about how he really wants to just explore different genres. Um, and this is a, a dip into into horror and creature for him. So um, wh where did you guys fall on it? Kev, after Funny. it settled for you, where did you? Funnily enough, Enjoy. I guess they actually could have called this movie Crazy Heart, but I won't say why. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, the... <sighs> It, no, it's a it's a very solid horror film. It's very brutal. Um, I didn't I didn't expect it to be as brutal as it was, and it's R rated. It's it's disturbing. It's really horrifying. Um, in terms of that, uh, in terms of screenplay, like even moments like Jake was just talking about, some of the screenplay felt a little off to me. Um, just didn't flow as well. And again, I had that same confusion that you did, which I don't know. I feel like that was that was a problem for me at first at the beginning. I was like, where I was confused as to who I was seeing. Um, mm -hmm. But as the picture goes on, um, Plemons is obviously great and and Carrie Russell. But you know, Plemons is such a good actor that when I feel like he's speaking dialogue that isn't great, you can tell. Um, even because he's a really good actor, but if lines aren't as well written, it does stand out because he's such a good actor, and I could just tell the line isn't as strong as the delivery. Um, but in terms of practical effects, everything's there. Uh, the score was great. I love that it was shot 185. 
um, very tall. It's it's extremely, um, extremely, extremely. Like, there's this very big aspect to the creature that we eventually get mm-hmm. to in the film that is really interesting. The and, Wendigo. They actually call it the Wendigo. Yeah, the Wendigo. And it's practical. It's really it's you know, and I give it credit for that. I mean, like, and Scott will go into all the detail next week in terms in terms of how they did it. But and mm-hmm. Jake, as as you mentioned, is a man in the suit. So it's a really cool. I I thought it was an interesting, very brutal, very very dark. Mm-hmm. Um, horror film. Um, would I ever watch it again? I don't know, but it, it worked. It worked for me. It just didn't blow my mind. So I'm just kind yeah, of like in that. Like I'm... it's it's mm-hmm. it's worth seeing, but I I wasn't anything that I that I that I maybe hadn't seen before mm-hmm. kind of thing. Jakey, yeah, I I liked it fine. Um, I if I'd be lying if I said I didn't hope to like it more. I love a good monster movie. I love a good creature mm-hmm. feature. Um, I think I was expecting more along the lines of like an A24 type yeah. cerebral horror but film. And this is much more of a straightforward, just monster movie. It is. Um, yeah. And yeah. I guess I, the, the best way I can sort of describe how I feel about it is that I love a lot of the individual parts, but not so much as, as to how they all work together. I like I that. the creature. I think the creature works really well on its own. I like sort of that we're in this community with this opioid crisis and like is the monster sort of a stand-in for the crisis that this community is dealing with mm-hmm. i like sort of the the themes of of abuse and all this sort of, there are a lot of individual things that i find to be very interesting what i don't think is that they all work well together mm-hmm. i i think it tries to be too many things at one time and can't decide exactly what it wants to be i think it wants to be an a24 film but it also wants to be a straightforward creature feature monster movie and I don't mean to put a movie in a box and say what it can and cannot be, but I would argue you can't be both. Um, That's interesting. And, I wonder if the marketing makes it look like an A24 yeah, movie. Like, I think I the first tra- ever... Honestly, I, the first trailer, I thought it was an A24 horror film. Yeah, but I wonder if he wanted... I don't know if he wanted it to be. Sure. You know? I, uh, I, I think maybe I, because you see like things like The Witch and such that Antlers falls into that, and I'm not quite sure if that was ever his intention. I thought it was A24 until I checked into The Junkie yesterday and found ah. that it was Fox Searchlight. <laughs> I actually, because I, I, didn't, I didn't read, uh, I mean, my, my, my rep had sent me the invite, but it didn't come from the studio, so yeah. I thought all along the whole thing was A24, no, or A24, I, no question. But all right, let's uh, bounce to Jake's over point, to- it doesn't play like that. Well, but I want to say to everybody too, do, try to check it out before next week's interview because Scott's a really interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. He's going to dive, you know, a little bit deeper right. into some of the things that happened in the film. And I, it'd be great if you guys are up to date. And on, it's Halloween weekend. There you yeah. yourself a little yeah. creature also, feature Halloween weekend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's also mention Scott's other work in case people aren't aware of it. I mean, like Crazy Heart, Out of the Furnace, which is incredible. Hostiles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Hostiles. Is it I'm Hostiles missing? or Hostiles? It's Hostiles. Hostiles? Uh, I'm try- yeah, that's what he said too, yeah. I'm just trying to think of what there's was the other, other. There's a fourth one. Crazy I, I said Heart. To, Did you mention Crazy Heart? Crazy Heart, yeah. Out of the Furnace, Hostiles, and there's one more. And I'm like blanking on it. But one of the things that we get into the discussion in the interview about is this is the first movie he's ever shot digitally. Mm-hmm. Every film in his career he shot on 35 millimeter film. Um, and he gives a really interesting answer as to why he decided to make the switch to uh, to uh, digital. Was Black Mass what you were thinking of? Yes, yes Black, Black Mass. Mass. That's it. Well there done. We That's it. Well done. The Johnny Depp cool. film. Good, pretty good filmography for this guy. I mean, he has Absolutely. A, out of the furnace. By the way, can I just mention this is a super underrated film? Like yeah. Christian Bale. I'm glad he brought up um, Woody Harrelson's Woody performance in that. Yep. When, yeah, when we just when we discussed. It looks monsters. like he's in uh, pre-production on another movie with Bale. He talks. Yes, well, he is. What he just yeah, said he talk, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he talks about fantastic. it. Fantastic. He yep. shoots it in four weeks. He said. Did All you right, know? Let, Netflix has a prequel for their uh, zombie film, Army of the Dead. This one's called Army of Thieves, uh, set in the Zack Snyder world, but not directed by Zack Snyder. Uh, I did not get a chance to see this one. You guys did check it out, though. Uh, Does it work as well as Army of the Dead? Is it a totally different type of film? You're talking to two different people. I think, think, Kevin, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think I liked Army of the Dead much more than you did. Therefore, I did not like Army of Thieves as much. I, I prefer Army of the Dead by far. I liked Army of the Dead a lot, but I think Army of Thieves is a better film. To, to underline Sean's question, though, which I don't think that answers, are they just completely different types of films, though? Yeah, I, 100%. I, okay, well, so, that's, so that's more the thing. It's not that they're the same thing, but one's better than the other. It's more what's your taste, one versus the other. Yeah, yeah but, but they're, but, both, uh, they're I, both heist I, films. Well, one, yeah. of them has, one of them, Zombie, plays a much bigger part in the heist than, than the other. Right. Okay. 
So what I really think is cool about Army of Thieves, so Matthias, uh, the safe cracker um, from the Army of the Dead, he is the gentleman who directed this film, and he's also mm-hmm. the star of this film. And uh, one of my favorite, my favorite aspect of Army of the Dead really was that character. If you remember those scenes when you would go up to the safe, and he would he would have those like moments with the safe, and like he'd be like listening to it. Was it was romantic. And, like, he had was like romantic. a relationship with them. <laughs> so this movie go, takes place before that Vegas heist, mm-hmm. and we learn a story about three other vaults that are that need that 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 have never been like unlocked in in this sense of safe cracking the code um would you, uh and in terms of like what was cool about it was there's four total and the fourth one is the army of the dead one right so the th- first three are the ones he's uh, that they're doing heists with here so like a team is put together um uh, of a group of people who are put together essentially to get these three vaults open okay. uh, and, uh, and Matthias's character who's also the director of the film um uh, g- joins this team and they go on this like run of like heists and it's okay. fun it's like I, I really dug it and like like to me like I love the musical romantic element of these scenes remember, remember in Army of the Dead where he was like everyone stop everyone get back I need <laughs> you know warm up my instruments um yeah. I don't know I think this movie moves better my problem with Army of the Dead I still like that film a lot is it could have lost 20 minutes. Like there was just, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't as invested in the Batista daughter story as I, as I wanted to be. Cause oh, I, I thought I that, t- that t- I just thought it took a little too long. Um, but like, this is a clean two hours, six minutes. It, 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 it whizzes by, um, I mean, they're, they're not far off from each other. I mean, Snyder is definitely a better director than Matthias, but I just think army of thieves. I've enjoyed more, um, just from the pacing perspective. I thought it was a better script. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I'll take Snyder over over Matias in terms of just like my personal favorite directors of those two. But I thought Matias did an excellent job here. And it's scored by Hans Zimmer and uh, I think Steve Mazzaro. Um, the Zimmer score, it, the score is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I Matias's energy, the character he plays in the film, that's what I have fun with. I like his excitement for the world and like the I, I i you're him the whole time you're 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 this curious hyper cool like fun it, it, i don't know to me it just worked i like the hyper sensitivity of focusing in on just these three heists uh, i'm i'm I, I don't know and then leading into where it goes with army of the dead i think it's a okay. that was a really well done film i was really it was better than i thought it was going to be okay because i went and going okay snyder's not directing this is this going to be any good? Mm-hmm. And it surprised me. I had fun with it. I recommend it. It's on Netflix. It's cool. I think it's a very well-made movie, a very well-made version of a movie you've seen 10,000 times before. Like it's, sure. to me, it, it very yeah. much hits all the same beats of like, you know, getting the team together and every team has a, every guy has a different role and they've got to do this and they've got to introduce them to that. And, you know, it's just like, the whole time I kept thinking, oh, like that's it's cool how he did that. It's cool, but like I've seen this movie. In fact, the only thing that I that it really super intrigued me that I thought was fascinating is that they were taking advantage of the fact that the world right now is focused on the zombies in America. Like that's where everyone's focus is. So they're trying to take advantage of the fact that people aren't really paying attention to what's going on right here, right now. Mm-hmm. And I thought like the, the the thing that that I loved the most is when it would hint to a movie that I liked better. Um, so I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was good, but I've seen it before and I've seen far better versions of it. Uh, another movie that we, uh, I think all three of us had a lot of fun with is Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho. Um, and I'll kick off and just mention that one of the things that, and and we're going to do this spoiler free because there are some big reveals waiting for you in Soho and, um, we're going to protect them for as long as possible because there are things that you should experience in the theater uh and the element of soho that i'm going to focus on because i'm sure the other guys are going to go in a different direction um is the performance of thomas and mckenzie uh who Mm. was extremely impressive to me in old uh taking on a very difficult part where she had to play the older version of a character who went to the beach that morning and then suddenly aged up and did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the the weirdness of that screenplay and i didn't I knew the premise of Soho was like, there's a girl who's able to transition between modern day and the 60s. That's hinted at in the trailer. Um, and part of the mystery is figuring out, you know, why that's happening to her and then and what's going on with the, the mystery and the heart of the story in the 1960s when she gets there. But that is scratching the surface of the amount of things that Thomas and Mackenzie has to carry in this film 
um, and and to even mention what they are would would be revealing too much about the movie. So um, there's not a prayer in hell that she'll get into awards consideration because it's a horror movie. And that's mm-hmm. unfortunate to me because I do think she gives one of the best performances I've seen this year. Uh, you know, and a lot of the conversation around Soho are going to be about uh, Edgar Wright and rightfully so. Uh, and and Christie's screenplay and the, the way the two of them collaborated and then on a- Anya Taylor Joy just, she just draws a lot of attention because of who she is um, and she's excellent in it as well too and I'm afraid too many people are going to sort of glance over Thomas and Mackenzie and I think she's absolutely incredible in this film and a, and a big big part of the reason why the movie works as well as it does so I want to start there and then uh, you guys can take it away. Uh, I'm, 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 the atmosphere in this film is what's interesting, right? It's like it, it's uh, so Chung Hoon Chung, who directed, who shot the film, um, also did the direct, directed uh, photography on Old Boy. So this is the this is coming from the cinematographer who directed that one of the greatest tracking shots in the history of cinema. Um, so you know you're going to be getting something beautiful. It's also shot on 35 mil. He did Steven the Spike Price. Lee one. No, 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 I don't, no, I don't think he DP'd that one. No, he, he did, did he did one. the the original old boy. Okay. Or, um, uh, I, I hope he didn't do the, the Spike Lee one. I don't think he did. <laughs> Probably not, um, no. I don't know. Uh, but uh, the tracking shot in the original old boy is incredible. Um, in terms of this film, so I, there's, I, I love a lot about this film, and then there are things that I didn't love, but there's enough that I do love about it that, like, I'm at, like, a four out of five for my, for my rating on this. Mm-hmm. Um, performance wise, I completely agree with you. Mackenzie is phenomenal. She is the star of the movie and the entire film rests on her. Um, Anya Taylor Joy is, is great in the film as well. She's more supporting, mm-hmm. but it, it's very, very interesting watching them play off of each other. Um, in the discussion we have with Edgar Wright, you can tell how much technically went into this film and it's mind blowing like, to mm-hmm. watch it. Like, cause it looks, it feels and looks so real and immersive and you're in it. It's dark. It's you're in the sixties, um, right when she steps out into the street and thunderballs on the screen and goes into cafe de Paris. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the way uh, Edgar described the mirrors and the dancing, I mean, it was cool. Like in, the, in, in this dancing scene, which is in the trailer where he spins her around and she becomes, you know, it goes from, on Anya to Thomason, that entire scene is one shot, and the actors were just jumping in and out of the frame, dancing like that. It was it's, it's insane how they pulled it off. Um, I also want to shout out Stephen Price, who's one of my favorite composers that doesn't get talked about a lot. This movie is so soundtrack heavy that mm. the score is kind of a background aspect, but it's important to the film. Stephen Price also uh, did brilliant work on Gravity. Gravity's probably I love his score for Gravity, um, but he also worked with Baby Driver with with. Um, with Edgar Wright. So that's kind of how they work together. But, you know, Edgar's films, like Quentin's films, are more soundtrack driven, minus Hateful Eight for Quentin, because that was very, very score driven. But um, I like that Stephen Price's score um, complements the soundtrack. Uh, everybody in this film, Diana Rigg, mm. I think it's her final performance of her career. It is, yep. Mm. It, unbelievable performance. Like, to me, that, that might be my favorite performance in the film. Um, my biggest issue with the film were that I thought the scares didn't the, the, the scare the scaring moments the actual jump scare moments I thought felt like haunted house scares. So as I'm watching the film, I'm I'm in it, and then they'll do they'll do something with a scary moment, and I'll and I'll and I, I'm reminded of being on a haunted house ride with like Lauren or her father, or you know, or, or and like it just the way it was like done. Um, but there's not enough of those where it hurt the film for me overall. I, I, mm. I still like the film a lot, and I'm, that's why I'm giving it a four out of five. But, you know, in terms of Edgar's filmography, I mean, I definitely think I still love Baby Driver more. I still love Shaun of the Dead more, Hot Fuzz more. Um, just in terms of his filmography, uh, Scott Pilgrim, I, I would put all those above Soho, but I still oh. like Solo a lot. But that's um, interesting. Oh, Soho a lot. So, in talking to Jake right after, you put it high, pretty high up in Edgar's filmography. Yeah, yeah, and the way, and, yeah, I, but I liked it a lot. I, uh, um, but all those things, the filmmaking, the score, the soundtrack, the performances are all great. I just, I, the scares didn't work for me. They felt like haunted house scares, which I'm sure maybe was maybe if it, even if it was the intention, it just it just didn't work for me at times. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I would go as far as saying that I loved it, and it's pretty high um, on my my tier of of Edgar Wright films. Um, you know, the thing that I, I love, and this is such a, a cliche in film criticism. But it really does feel like the kind of horror film that they don't make anymore. And, and the, the closest thing I can equate it to is uh, the old George C. Scott film, The Changeling. Not so much in terms of plot, but just this idea that 
it's a slow burn of a mystery and there's a little bit of like sort of a ghost in there, but there's also sort of this underlying sinister something that happened that you need to get to the bottom of. And it's really less so where, you know, it's less so about ghosts and scares and more so that they are an element in a much bigger story, a much bigger mystery. And you know, that those used to be much more prominent. I feel like back in the sixties and the seventies and I think changeling is like early eighties. Um, but we really don't get movies like that anymore. Um, you know, maybe the others was maybe the, like the, one of the last big ones that we got like that. Um, I love films like that, and mm-hmm. and I think Edgar Wright loves films like that. And I think you know he is he is a filmmaker who crafts films based on what he loves. You know, very much in Tarantino esque style. You know, he loves something and he kind of wants to do his version of that. Um, and I think it's cool to see him sort of crafting his own version, obviously with the Edgar Wright spin. Uh, Kevin, you're absolutely right. The film is such a vibe, like just just mm. the feel of it. You're in it. You're yeah, in it. Yeah, just just when she steps into 1960s London, and it is not just the it's not just the tangible things. It's not just the music that you hear. It's not just the the cars and the clothes and the fashion. Just the way the movie feels and it's shot and the way that everyone's acting and behaving the lights, and, and yeah, the everything reds, about yeah. it just feels like it's a movie from that time. And then it flashes back and all of a sudden it's a movie from this time. Um, you almost feel like you're time traveling with her in a way. Um, but yeah, I, I very much love this movie. It, it's, it, it's not you know, a, a, a scary movie in the traditional sense, but I've, like I've said before many times, that has nothing to do with whether or not it's a horror film. It is straight up a horror film. You can't say, you can't look at the events that happen in this movie and tell me it's not a horror film. It very much is. And, um, you know, so I, yeah, I, I loved, uh, all the, you know, if, if, if I complained about antlers liking the pieces, but not the sum, this is a situation where I love the pieces, love the sum. And, uh, you know, very, this is very much my jam. Where are Why you at a five? Man? Four and a half. Where are you, Sean? Four and a half. Cool. I, I really loved it. Gabe but, but saw here's it. An where, element. I want to know Gabe's rating too. Oh yeah. yeah Gabe saw it. Uh, I did see it. I really, I really, really enjoyed it. It was, um, it was a lot of fun. And it, I loved that going into it, I wasn't sure if it was going to feel like an Edgar Wright movie, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. It felt mm-hmm. very different. Not that that's a bad thing. Like, I love that he's doing something new, but I was like, all his movies feel, there's, there's moments in them where you go, this is Edgar so Wright. I am so glad that you said that, because I was just about to say, if I watched this movie and didn't know it was him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known have it was guessed. Edgar Wright. Yeah. I wouldn't have guessed, yeah. but I think that's okay. I will yeah, say the, a good thing. the uh, again, no spoilers, the third act, and as elements of it become more and more prominent, I yeah. think that's when it really starts to feel, it feels like even just the look of it is like, ah, this is this is Edgar Wright's aesthetic. This is the mm-hmm. way that he would portray this. Um, and I don't really know how to describe that without getting into spoilers, but, yeah, but the way hard. that he sort of, the way that he sort of um, realizes things visually is very mm. Edgar Wright, um, mm. which I thought was fun. It, I, it was like he was in this new world that that he's never taken us in before, um, visually and aesthetically and, and even um, tonally in a lot of ways. It didn't feel like an Edgar Wright thing, but it really does land um, in an Edgar Wright way, which well, is, as a fan of his, it was really fun. Because as he talked about in the interview with us, he really favored long takes. Mm-hmm. And Edgar Wright doesn't do long For takes. For narrative reasons, He does reasons syncopated too. edits, you know, like... His camera is whipping around often, and he's he's chopping up his edits in a yeah. way that matches whatever music he's using, and he doesn't do that at all here. Well, actually, do you remember Some. that incredible one in Baby Driver at the beginning when he's walking to the like? Oh, he's that's walking, an amazing crosses the street, shot yeah. set to that song. down the street, like tap, I, taps things, like oh. Mm-hmm. I doubt so that good. I doubt that he's responding to like criticism in any way. Sure, but it does feel like. People can be kind of reductive when they're criticizing filmmakers and like, you know, whether it's J.J. Abrams lens flares for Edgar Wright, it's the quick cut. It's like, OK, he made Scott Pilgrim and now everything he makes is a quick cut, which is which sure. is true. He loves the insert like he's a big fan of the insert. Yeah. Yeah. Shot um, of the dead. Yeah. All that stuff. But I yeah. think all along the way, he's proven that he he's not fitting some sort of arbitrary style. He's very much this is just the way he wants to tell a yep. movie or tell a story within a film. And I think this is like again, I don't think he was on purpose responding to that sort of reductive criticism, but it very much proves that he is he's a masterful filmmaker and he understands intention. Um yep. and maybe you don't agree with his intention. Maybe you don't like the style of his intention with the quick inserts and stuff. But this shows that he has he has depth, I think. Well, Gabe, did you love it? Um I'm curious. I, I, I just I'm getting a last, sense that yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. I just saw it last night, so I'm still like uh, thinking on it. I think I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, the friend that I went and saw it with, 
uh, we both were, you know how you leave a movie and you're kind of on a high and you're like, mm. wow, like that was so much fun. Like did not know it was going to yeah. be that much fun. So I think I will come to love it because it was nothing but positive. Um, but I wouldn't say it like swept me away the way some films can. That's not a bad sure. thing. Um, yeah. Like but Dune, I, is a, Dune sweeps you away immediately. Right, like which has all out. this other baggage yeah. with it. But yeah, but I, yeah. I I did really, really like it. And I think I might love it eventually because um, yeah. I do love Edgar Wright. It's just, it's I want to see it again. I will say, like, like to your point, Gabe, like I, I walked out thinking like, I think I even texted like, guys, I really, really dug that, mm -hmm. uh, but never used the L word. And, and I'm now like a week removed from having seen it. And um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's just, it is a, it is a lot. It's it, it's a, it's a pretty dense, it's very dense. <laughs> yeah. And like, I um I saw it and back it to has, back. The... Sorry, it has really satisfying twists and turns. Yeah, that yeah, can be hard 100%. to do in a, in sort of a mystery these days. Yeah. To, to get sort of got by the yeah. by mm -hmm. the story, but it has some really convincing twists oh, and turns. Yeah, I definitely and, and I will say that and that's one thing he does really well. I definitely did not see what comes coming. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you know, it, it was definitely which is great. Uh, it, it was a great. It's gr the movie unravels beautifully. Um. I saw it back to back with Eternals right after I got off the morning show. Oh, um, Ooh, that's a lot of and, and so that was a very interesting <laughs> uh, back to back uh, day. But um, no, I, I I'm I, I'm I want to see it again because I feel like everything I just said about what I loved about it, like like makes me feel like I probably I don't I want to visit it again. But right now I'm at a four out of five and I'm cool that's with fine. that rating. I just I just want to yeah, I want to think rating. about it a little bit more. Four is yeah, great. yeah. Uh, it's Halloween weekend. Uh, and so we wanted to stay in the horror genre as we went to our blend game for this week. And one of the things we've never talked about is the concept of the final girl, uh, the the protagonist in a horror movie who makes it to the very end. Uh, but and I turned to a close friend of mine, Adam Frazier, who is a horror uh, aficionado. And we discussed the concept of the final girl in preparation for my choice for this, because there are some who I think are on the line. And then Adam also brought up a couple of uh, factors that he thought factor into whether somebody is a final girl or not. So uh, I'll bring up some of those if they play into uh, some of your choices. So, uh, Jiggy, why don't you kick us off as our horror aficionado on the show uh, right. with your favorite final girl? I, I went through um, a lot of different choices in my head on this one. Um, even so much is changing like up until like the last like last couple of hours um because there are so many great ones mm -hmm. but this is one where i really had to weigh in on like favorite versus best or favorite versus you know most interesting or favorite versus most tragic um and so i think if we're going favorite just in terms of you know uh, i'm going sydney prescott played by the uh, nev campbell and scream and the reason i'm choosing sydney prescott is i love the idea of a final girl who was raised on final girls. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of a, of a final girl who knows what to do because she grew up watching all of the great final girls of our generation. Like she, you know, there are multiple moments on the phone where she says, you know, like it's, it's stupid. They should, they run up the stairs when they should be running out the front door. It's insulting. So I just think that that's <laughs> fascinating. I love the meta aspect of it. Um, but I also, and, and the, the movies also explore Sydney much better than they get credit for. Even as the movies kind of deteriorate, there's still a lot of fascinating elements to her character and really the, the tragedy of her character, the tragedy that, that this horrible thing happened to her and continues to happen to her. And, and really, I mean, more so than before, long before the, the 2018 Halloween focused on the trauma of Laurie Strode, mm -hmm. Scream 3 really focused on, on the trauma of Sidney Prescott. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my favorite shots of the four Scream films is the very last shot of Scream 3. At this time, we just thought it was going to be a trilogy and it was going to be done forever. The very last shot is Sydney Prescott after all the horrible things have happened. She's alone in her kitchen and she hears the creaking of a door open. And she looks behind her and she sees that the door is cracked open. And then she just ignores it and walks off frame, cuts to black. That's the end of the movie. And I always love the meaning of that. I always love this idea of like she is so strong that this horrible, what would be a terrifying thing for anyone after what she's endured something as simple as a door cracking open should traumatize a person. And she's so, so strong that she can just kind of say, screw it and walks away. Mm -hmm. And I really love how much the movie kind of dives into sort of the trauma of what she's gone through and 
how it ties back to her mother and 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 how she has to relive this tragedy that happened to her mother over and over again because these crazy assholes keep taking advantage of it and using it as an excuse to go after her and her friends. It's a really fascinating character study that doesn't get as much credit as it deserves. And the fact that it's built on a love of final girls in horror movie just makes it all the better. So Sidney Prescott is my is my favorite. So I went Sydney as well, too. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted a whole rant. Doing- that's okay. You were saying all the things that I would agree with. Um, and, but one of the only other reasons that I would add to it is because so many of the final girls, um, except for one who I want to throw out there uh, after I hear Kevin's pick, uh, they are, it's random. You know, they, they, they are being stalked by somebody, but they have no idea why they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that even includes Laurie Strode, who I think is, you know, the, the preeminent final girl. Right. Because they removed the whole, I mean, depending on which Halloween line you follow, they either are or are not brother and sister. I'm saying from just from the very first Halloween movie, Mm -hmm. you know, she was essentially just the babysitter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, And they tried to give motivation later on in the, in the franchise, which then they chucked. Yeah. But all of the Scream movies are, ex- they're all built off motivation of Sydney, And I yeah. think that that's really fascinating. And yeah. I think with each of the sequels, they stretch a little bit, but not too far no. off of yeah. when you get to the reveal of who it is, you're like, oh, all right. Yeah, I kind of see yeah. that. Sure, and that it's, makes sense. It's sad, isn't it? Like, like the idea that your friends and family and significant others are being killed because of you? Like, that's, sure. that's, that's. that's- Yes, I would agree, 100%. And um, and I just think that she is, you know, I wanted to pick somebody who was super resilient uh, mm-hmm. in their parts and not somebody who is lucky, you know. Uh, this is a conversation I had with Adam about um, the girl from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, Sally was another one I wanted to talk about. I'm so glad you're bringing her up. Sally's an excellent one, but what we were discussing is that um, – she never and, and Adam's one of Adam's things in terms of how to be a, a, a strong final girl is you have to have some sort of encounter, like a pushback with yeah. the villain. You have to fight back in some way, shape or form. And she never does with Leatherface or any of his family. She basically just survives. Right. Yeah. She runs and runs and runs until she gets in the back of the. I mean, the tagline of the film is off. who will survive and, and what will become of them. Like, you, you know, it's but, so but that was one of the I, factors I, as to why I couldn't choose her. Before we get to Kevin's, I do want to address that I am. Fast. I've always wondered what happened to because like Sally of, of the final girls that I sort of think about when bringing this up, she's the one I'm most concerned about in terms of what ha- like you talk oh, about resilient. Yeah, you you watch that the, the final the, one of the most iconic horror scenes of all time, which is her screaming and crying in the bed of the truck, driving away yeah. while Leatherface does what they call the dance um, with the chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> and and you you look at that girl and you think scene. like her life is over like she yes. she will never recover from that you right. she will never recover from that right, I, right, I, right. I I know this is stupid to sound but like I worry about her a lot that's interesting but uh, yeah you're that right means the movie had an effect on you that's awesome yes. Kev who'd you go with well I, mean, I went I went Sydney Prescott as well but <laughs> oh no. yeah. Yeah. What? are you kidding me wow. but, all right I'm so shocked already- I would have thought we had all three three different ones. You spent so much time explaining every reason why I would have picked her. I'm gonna, um, I'm going to cheat here and actually nominate the one that I was considering going with, uh, but I ultimately went with Sydney Prescott. Okay. Um, so this go is ahead. gonna. This, I, I think this is one of the most underrated horror films to come out in recent years, and I think this is one of the best final girls of all time. And it's definitely Aaron Harson from Your Next. Oh, good, good choice. choice. Cool. If you remember that movie? I like that she, movie quite a bit. And she, she goes over to that family reunion they're at the yeah. dinner and there's the masked killers but we learn later in the film that she went to a, like a survival camp as a kid so she was all like geared up to like put booby traps all over the house and then there, i mean that her what she ends up doing in the end of that film is so awesome yeah. um i just remember seeing your next i didn't know anything about it like really going in um but like laura and i were like blown away and i was just looking through a uh, i was looking through a list of different final girls in horror over the years and like there's so many. I mean, obviously, you know, we Sydney Prescott is, I think, is the best one because just my generation, that's my generation's, sure. you know, final girl. Um, Laurie Strode, obviously, you you know, that's, that's I feel like that's the the ultimate that you would probably even think of. Or, I mean, even Ellen, Rip, you know, Ripley from um, Alien. For that sure, was a great another, gift. That that which, really kind of made me pause and rethink things whenever yeah. Gabe put that gift out there earlier today. The, my pick also, would also be Sydney, but the Ellen Ripley is like the, the dark horse of well, the, the one also, I would another consider Another underrated... Second. Another underrated one would be Sarah Connor. Sarah Connor. Uh, in that's Termi- that's uh, what I was Terminator. wondering. Yes. Like 
A hundred percent. The Terminator is a horror film. No yes. question about yeah. it. It's a I horror Ripley, sci-fi film. I take Ripley over Connor, though, personally. Uh, Interesting. Ooh. Interesting. A, uh, I, I, Ripley I, uh, in the first movie? In Alien? Yes. I like yeah. Alien better than the first Terminator. Because she's not a final but, girl in Aliens. Right. Or she's Terminator an action two. protagonist. Yeah, exactly. Is she yeah, a final yeah. girl in Terminator 2? Not, not really. No, it's the same it's thing. Not, he, it's an action movie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So this will come um, up again. This will come up again later in some of the audience picks. I threw one in here that I disagree but I, with. I, I see it, and I don't know what you're talking about. Like, right? That's kind of ridiculous. I think maybe they were just trying to be funny. Like, like maybe they thought the. But like, I, they're right. the final person in the movie, <laughs> but they're not. Sure. They don't really fit but, the criteria of a, a final girl. If you haven't seen your next, see it. Uh, Aaron Good Harson choice. is is the actress um, who plays the character. It's. I, I mean, I guess we kind of spoiled it in terms of me explaining why i like the character but i mean okay. that final, like isn't years final old. girl a spoiler in yeah. itself yeah. sort of yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it is yeah. um but um sydney prescott is the ultimate and for every reason jake said for every, uh, the point that jake made about her being raised on final uh girls is, is is very very on point and very much why she's incredible um and that character is just and that's the brilliance so of, of scream and, as a whole yeah is yeah, that it's it just brilliant yeah the genre yeah that whole movie's amazing, but if yeah, but uh, just wanted to shine a light on your next. Uh, I just think it's underrated, and uh, she's an incredible final girl. Like it's a great character, and the and just what she does to everybody at the end is awesome. Okay, our audience weighed in, and they went with. Uh, let's see, we have Phil who said uh, Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode, William and Harry Lichtman went with Nev Campbell's Sydney MP says Amanda Seyfried's Needy uh, from Jennifer's Body. Great Same choice. choice. Great choice. Great choice. Um, and then Retrograve <laughs> tried to slip this one past us and chose Dutch in Predator. No. It's, the same, it's the same problem as Aliens. It's, I'm sorry, it's an action retrograve. movie. It's not a horror movie. And it's also uh, not a girl. Not a yeah, girl. Well, no, there's, 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 there's Final Guys. Final Girl is more... Okay, well, when we do Final Guy Blend, then... But I feel well, no, like... But hang on. Okay, hang on, hang on. Let's have this conversation then. Final Girls is yeah. not... It's gender specific because of when it was came about. Final Girl is kind of like a punk rock part of horror genre that was like came out of a book, right? It was like a bo- someone wrote a book about like horror films, and that it was it was coined that tor- that term, Final Girl, I believe. That might be right. I don't know. I don't know if yeah. someone coined it in a book or not. But the idea of it is this punk rock nature of like these women at the end of horror movies that are badasses, right? But. The definition itself, I don't think we need to have a final guy blend because that just sounds ridiculous. True. There are some example. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but no, it's you less can't, about. because there aren't any, Gabe. You don't, don't think, think there, there are any? Are, no, I don't think there are any guys. You think they always put them in action movies? They just turn into action survive. movies? I mean, if you could tell me one, maybe Ash. Ash, probably. Ash, Ash. Ash. That's a, that's a, oh, that's right. a good but it's, one. But it's very action heavy. It is. Uh, Evil Dead's yeah. horror. Evil, Evil Dead's Evil definitely Dead's a definitely horror, horror movie. Point being, yeah. though, my, my primary issue with Dutch is not that he's a guy. Mm. It's that it's an action movie. Sci-fi and he's just yeah. he's just fighting yeah. stuff through the whole movie. It's not about yes. him surviving He was never scared. Yeah. He's never no. scared at any I point. Mean, <laughs> Did you see his arms? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when they, when him he looked and, like Arnold um, Schwarzenegger. <laughs> when, they, when they do that, like, clap. Uh, yeah. But I... Uh, I would argue the Terminator is more of a horror film than. Oh, Predator. the first Terminator is a horror film. It's a yeah. legit yeah. horror film. Yeah. Yeah. That's the uh, that's the film. that's the Jim Cameron model. You What's get him like with horror action. You write a dollar sign at the end of it, turn it into an action movie. <laughs> Terminators. <laughs> I still think one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in a film. To Avatar of horror, horror moments. Well, Avatar, yeah, Avatar was bad. Um, <laughs> How many S's but, is no. Avatar Five going to have at the end? Of it? <laughs> yeah. So many. <laughs> no, but I mean, I still can't get over the scene of of Sarah Connor on the fence as oh, she's just yeah, yeah. annihilated oh. by the, the bomb. It's a great uh, and, edit. And, and, yeah. Uh, it's honestly like that scene as a kid, that whole sequence when she has that nightmare or that flash forward of what's going to mm. happen is just horrifying. Like it's and Gabe's right. There's the horror elements of maybe besides true lies or ti- Titanic, I guess, has some horror elements, too, obviously. But in terms of like, I'm just thinking of, uh, of what Gabe tragedy. said about Cameron camp tragedy. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sean. Yes. This is from this is from Paste magazine. <laughs> Um, final guys in horror movies. Okay, <laughs> you have uh, 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 Carrie Elwes in Saw. Okay, yeah, yeah. terrible okay. performance. Uh, <laughs> Casey, it's a bad performance. Casey in The Faculty. Okay, uh, but Rodriguez. but they all but they all survive. You have 
John in Hall- Halloween H two O, which definitely counts. He plays the Laurie Strode, literally the Laurie Strode character but in I Halloween. Mean, by the time you get to H two O, like I'm not paying attention. Yeah, if, if but my, the number my three point is they exist. I love water. Okay, they exist. My, my point is they exist. I do yeah. think that they. I do think that there's something to if we were gonna like have a whole um, sort of film studies discussion about it. I do think there's a trend of if you're making a horror movie and it's a guy, traditionally mm-hmm. they always make it more action heavy than the okay. quote unquote final girl, which the final girl is, has this connotation of like survival and yeah. sort of like the one last fight. Whereas like the guys are usually like fighting through the whole thing. Cause it's, really which is perfect movie. for your next, because that's like the, it, it just that badass type mm-hmm. character. Just like it's, it's, she's Ooh. so great. Uh, Devin Sawa in Final Destination, the ultimate final guy. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. I love the Final Destination series. I love the third one, by the way, the roller coaster. Which one's the the one that ends with the first Final Destination? I don't remember. Like that the ending was a sequel, and you think everyone survives, and it turns out they're getting on the plane with Devin Sawa. Really? That's interesting. I don't know if that was five Shit, did I just, I'm sorry if I ruined it for you guys. That's no, okay. I'll never but do you guys them. remember the first time you saw that highway scene? Oh, that's yeah. two. From, that's from two, part yeah. two. Yeah. I still look at log trucks because in because in Southeast Texas, where I'm from, log trucks are a big deal. They're all, yeah, I don't really see them in Chicago as much anymore, but but oh, it's a huge deal. I still think of them bouncing that when it falls, when that when that chain, every time someone's drinking coffee when they're driving, oh. Those films are underratedly brilliant. Yeah. Like yeah. and I'm not saying all of them, but I mean, like, Todd. like the cool, way the cool design. Moment. Oh, it's so cool! And like the like, just like a scene in a kitchen where someone's trying to like put their hand down a, a garbage yeah. disposal because like because they, it, it taps so into things good. that we've all thought about. Yes. everything feels dangerous. But, everything yeah, feels that, dangerous. Yeah, that car scene in part two. Yeah. It's a we brilliant do, idea. It's a great idea. Great. Yeah. The roller coaster one's concept. great. I love the third one too. They did a 3D one, yeah. which is really the 3D there, was yeah. cool as hell there, too. There is or, a there is a Final Destination. I can't remember which one it is. And the end of the film is you think they that they've survived and, and they've made it, and it's them getting on the plane that explodes in Final that's Destination. Great. That, that's great. I don't think I ever saw that. One. Was that the Final Destination? It's they possible. It was, it's the, possible. The, it was like there was a, the the they put the yeah. the before it. That's I think, brilliant. I think. If that's the if that's the last one they ever made, perfect franchise. Yeah, right. Yeah. I love that Stop franchise. Just, just end right there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So for next week, uh, you can reach out on Twitter using hashtag Idris Elba blend, and you can let us Ooh. know your pick. Uh, Wait. Your favorite film by Idris Elba? Yes, sir. Is TV a a possibility yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. With actors, it's the always I'm, yeah, yeah. I figured someone would throw that out there. Uh, with actors, it's always about the performance. So it's it's whatever performance moved you the most. Obviously, TV yeah. roles give you more time to mm, be affected. Sure. So it's kind yeah. of cheating. But if okay. it, if it's your you know favorite, what I'm it's your surprised favorite. with there was a moment in the office. I'm surprised this didn't become a meme when Idris Elba was cast in the Suicide Squad because there was a moment in the office where um, he comes in. He has like a five or six episode stretch where he comes in as like a big boss and he's kind of a, he's kind of mean to everybody and everyone's looking at him and Dwight says, yeah, he's kind of got a, like a Will Smith vibe to him. <laughs> I'm always amazed that that clip was never pulled whenever he was cast as basically like the Will Smith character yeah, in yeah, yeah. the Suicide That's Squad. Funny. That's yeah. pretty funny. That is interesting. Wow. All right. Our next premium episode for people who subscribe is going to be the IMDB game. <laughs> yes! Never fun. Yes. I never love fun. this game. No, I know. See, terrible. I gotta be honest. I don't. I don't it's like terrible. when we play the games because I've got such a nice streak going that eventually I'm gonna have to lose, and I'm not ready for that. Oh, day. you can sit this one out. I can hate I? this game. No, I actually hate it. <laughs> I love this game. Uh, again, you can get access to that and all of the episodes of Real Blend Premium by going to cinemablend.com backslash Real Blend Premium. We'll be back next week uh, with a new episode and an interview with Scott Cooper. So make sure you go check out Antlers before that happens. Follow us this week. On social media, at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach. And the show is at Real Blend. Talk to you guys next week. Minority Report. Jaws. Hubie anyways. Aw. Never going to get Spielberg. Now we're not going to get Spielberg. Yeah, you ruined it. <laughs> <laughs>